Hi, my name is Bianca Pashola. I'm the COO of SIX, and welcome to the Aquila Resources Live Investor Summit. I'd like to start today by introducing our presenter, Barry Hildred. To kick things off, Barry will be telling the company's story, and then we'll be accepting questions. You can submit your questions in the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, without further ado, take it away, Barry. Thanks, Bianca. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. And hopefully everyone's healthy and, and safe out there. Uh, we thought it'd be a good idea in this uh, current environment uh, to give everyone, our stakeholders, uh, a virtual update. So we're going to be going through a full uh, corporate presentation. It does come on the heels of a new preliminary economic assessment uh, that we press released last week on the Back 40 project. Uh, so for those of you that have been following the company, we did put out a feasibility study on back 40 back in 2018. That feasibility study focused on the open pit operation only. So this PEA uh, kind of gives an enterprise view of the project incorporating the underground. Uh, there still is a lot of work to do on the underground. We still need to do further geotech uh, investigation. We still need to do additional drilling. Um, and uh, of course, uh, it will have to be permitted uh, the underground isn't expected to start until 2030, so uh, about 10 years from today. Um, but the ore body is open at depth, so we did want to demonstrate uh, that uh, you know there is currently an in the known resource, underground resource, about 6 million tons. So we want to incorporate that uh, into the mine plan, and the idea would be in the future to continue to drill at depth and add tons as we move forward. So um, I'm just going to start off with some highlights uh, on Aquila. So these are some things that uh, you know certainly we're excited about uh, at the company. First of all, uh, we're in a good tier one jurisdiction. So we have a portfolio of high grade assets, good metals, gold, copper, uh, zinc. Uh, in the upper Midwest, uh, we own three assets on what's called the Pinocchian volcanic belt that spans the upper peninsula of Michigan down through uh, northern Wisconsin. We do think that this belt offers uh, a new district uh, potential. Um, it's a safe jurisdiction, has access to infrastructure. Uh, there are 24 known mineral occurrences on the belt, only one past producer. So we think there's a lot of opportunity here. It's good to be a first uh, mover, I think, uh, on this belt. And uh, we will continue to look for opportunities on the belt as we go forward. Um, we continue to try to push uh, back 40 towards uh, shovel ready status. Uh, we have been advancing through the permitting process. We have received the four state issued permits uh, that we applied for back at the end of 2015. And I'll talk about that a little bit in the future. Uh, we have a, a strong stakeholder base, uh, Orion Mine Finance, uh, Ruffer and Hud Bay own a little more than 50% of the company. And a Cisco Gold Royalties has a gold and silver stream on the Back 40 project. And I'll talk about the details of uh, that stream in a, in a minute. Um, we think we have an attractive relative valuation versus our peers. If you look at us uh, on a gold equivalent basis, uh, we trade at $15 US an ounce versus a pure median uh, close to $60. And we're trading at a price than that asset value about 0.3 times versus a pure median of uh, 0.5. So, and, the, and there's no value uh, in our opinion being attributed to not only the upside of Back 40, but uh, the other exploration assets that we have uh, on the Pinocchian belt. So just some, some recent accomplishments. Uh, we did, uh, again, on the, on the permitting side of Back 40, we have continued to move forward on the permitting and we have received the four uh, major permits uh, that uh, we applied for in 2015. Uh, two of these permits were challenged and uh, did receive contested case hearings. Uh, and so far, all legal rulings to date have been in favor of the mine and, and, and permits have been upheld. We're still waiting on a uh, ruling on a wetlands contested case and we hope to receive that uh, at any moment. Uh, we've been working constructively with our stakeholders, including a Cisco. So recently we did amend our gold purchase agreement with a Cisco and it accelerated access to a portion of funds. So it has provided some short-term funding for the company. 
And we continue to have ongoing discussions uh, with other stakeholders uh, and other investors about funding uh, the long-term development uh, of, the, uh, of the project. Uh, at the same time, we have been reviewing opportunistic M&A opportunities. We do think there's an opportunity in this market uh, for some consolidation, and uh, we will continue to look at those opportunities as they become available. Um, we, again, continue to advance uh, back 40, working on uh, getting us a, the site compliant with all of our permits. The permits have a number, number of conditions associated with them. We have to get the site compliant before we uh, uh, before we begin construction. And uh, we also recently evaluated and completed the evaluation of the underground mining potential uh, with the uh, the release of this uh, PEA, which we spoke about uh, last week. Uh, so just looking at the area uh, we're in, that sort of shaded area in the middle of the map is the Pinocchian volcanic belt. Again, it spans the upper peninsula of Michigan uh, down through northern Wisconsin. We own through it three assets on this belt, Back 40 being our flagship, which resides in Michigan, and Bend and Reef, uh, which are earlier stage exploration. Bend is a, is a copper gold project. Reef is a gold copper project. Again, their exploration stage, we think very uh, promising assets, uh, both located in Wisconsin, also on the belt. Um, this region has been experiencing uh, a bit of a mining resurgence. Uh, both states, Wisconsin and Michigan, have recently updated their, uh, their mining laws. Uh, and Michigan's actually permitted uh, three mines under that new mining law, including Eagle, which you can see on the map, which is about 130 miles north of Back 40. And that uh, project, it's owned by Lundin. That mine went into operation in 2014. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about Back 40. Um, so again, it's 100% owned uh, by Aquila. Uh, it is a gold, copper, zinc deposit, so it's polymetallic. We reacquired the asset from HUD Bay back in 2014. Again, we received uh, the four major permits that we uh, applied for back at the end of 2015. Uh, it is, uh, we did complete an open pit feasibility study in August of 2018, and the permits pertain only to that open pit uh, operation. Uh, and recently, again, we, we did announce the results of our PEA last week, and it did incorporate uh, the underground resource. Again, uh, we think there's a lot of attractive uh, exploration opportunities uh, at Back 40. It's open at depth, so we think there's uh, you know, a real opportunity to expand the resource and add tons at depth. Uh, it is also a VMS deposit. They do tend to occur in clusters and there are a number of targets uh, near deposit that uh, we will be looking to pursue uh, in the future as well. Uh, it's a strategic location on the Pinocchian belt. Again, uh, we think it's a district scale opportunity and uh, there will be opportunity for synergies between uh, these different projects uh, in the coming years. So this is just a site plan of uh, the Back 40 mine. Uh, this uh, really hasn't changed since the uh, feasibility study uh, back in 2018. You can see that the active project area is 1,200 acres, but we do control mineral rights in the area uh, of a little over 3,200 acres. Uh, so just focusing back on the PEA, um, uh, you know, I'll just take you through uh, some of the economics and, and maybe some of the, the key updates or changes from the feasibility in 2018. First of all, obviously, it incorporates the known underground resource. Uh, the second thing we did is we reduced uh, the throughput in the mill uh, from 4,000 tons per day on the sulfide plant to 2,800 tons per day. And the reason for that was to better align uh, the operation with the mining rate in the underground. Uh, it also has the effect of reducing the capex, so that lower throughput uh, did effectively reduce the capex by uh, $44 million and brought the, the uh, initial uh, capital to $250 million, which we think is a very financial, uh, financeable project in this market. Uh, with the addition of the, of the underground, you increase the mine life. So the mine life went from seven to 12 years. 
And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the ore body is open to depth, and we do think there's a real opportunity to add tonnage and uh, further expand mine life down the road. Uh, this PEA also includes all the permit conditions uh, from permits that were issued uh, since the feasibility study. So we've incorporated those permit conditions uh, into the PEA and it's reflected in, in uh, the economics. Uh, there is some opportunities. We did speak in the press release. Uh, there, there may be some opportunities to increase gold recoveries in the future. On the flotation, flotation side of the, the mill, uh, we're recovering about 68-69% uh, of the gold. With uh, gold above $1,600 an ounce, there may be an opportunity to invest and to tweak that flow sheet um, to improve those recoveries on a go forward basis. So these are things that we'll continue to evaluate as we go forward. In terms of the economics, uh, utilizing a, a discount rate of 6%, um, the project uh, produced an MPV of $176 million. That's on an after-tax basis. And the internal rate of return was 26%. Uh, if you translate that to spot today, and, and you know, we used 1998, which was the spot when we put out the press release last week, uh, you know, currently gold is, is having a bit of a, a sell-off today, uh, but we used a dollar for zinc and, and for this uh, spot calculation, and zinc today is trading at a dollar nine. So, uh, you know, given the polymetallic nature of the project, you know, when, when some commodities fall, others go up, it, it kind of balances out the economics. But uh, using current spot prices, uh, you generated an after-tax MPV north of 300 million US, and uh, your, your internal rate of return starts to approach uh, 40%. Um, so the average annual production, uh, you're looking at about 120,000 uh, gold equivalent ounces on, a, on an annual basis, and the mill head grade is, is uh, over four grams. So the next slide just looks at the production highlights and uh, you can see on a gross revenue by metal basis, uh, given the current, uh, you know, sort of base uh, case metal prices that we used and we used 1485 gold in our model and we used dollar eight zinc. You can see that uh, gold represents 45% of the gross revenue generated by the project. Zinc represents 38%. When we put the feasibility study together, it was sort of evenly split. It was 41% gold and 41% zinc. But because of that change in pricing, we're starting to see uh, the sensitivity of the project to gold. And, and we have put a, a chart there on the bottom left uh, corner of the slide. And you can see we track gold prices all the way up to $2,400 an ounce. And you can see at $2,000, close to where spot is today, um, you know, obviously the IRR benefits, but uh, also the, uh, the gold percentage of gross revenue goes north of 50%. So, you know, above $2,000 an ounce, it, all other things uh, staying equal, uh, it really does become a gold project. And in year one, you produce 107,000 ounces of gold, 206,000 ounces of gold equivalent. Uh, again, the, the uh, project contains two high-grade gold gossens near surface. You mine those in the early years. So in the first two or three years, you're generating a lot of revenue from that gold. So this is a production profile. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this chart, but you can see uh, the split between gold. So that's actual gold production. Uh, and uh, non-gold production. It's pretty evenly split uh, throughout the project, uh, but certainly more heavily weighted to the gold side in the first three years, and then after year four, uh, starts to turn more to the base metals. Uh, the flow sheet really hasn't changed uh, very much at all from the feasibility study. Again, we brought the throughput down a little bit, uh, and on the oxides, we did add a SART plant. The SART plant uh, does have some initial capital uh, involved and, and uh, you have to uh, spend money to build that start plant uh, inside the facility, but uh, it doesn't prove the quality of the gold silver dore. And uh, most importantly, it has an impact on operating expenses going forward because it requires us to use less cyanide uh, in the processing of the gold ore. So uh, that you know reduction of cyanide uh, helps the operating expenses going forward. 
Uh, so just looking at capital and operating uh, costs, uh, first on the capital cost side, we've sort of broken it down into uh, major categories on the left. Uh, we did use a contingency of 14%, uh, might be considered low for some people for a project uh, in sort of PEA stage. I just remind everybody that we are coming up a feasibility study that we did in uh, the end of 2018. And a lot of these costs have been updated and were supported by uh, vendor bids as well. So we, we feel quite confident uh, on the capital costs going forward. The operating costs, you can see our total site OPEX is uh, $52 uh, per ton. And uh, sustaining capital for the open pit is 46 million. Uh, in the underground is 99 million. And uh, we do include full mine closure costs in there of 75 million. So the, uh, the pit will be backfilled and the site will be uh, fully reclaimed. <clears throat> so just looking at uh, the, the cash costs, C1 uh, cash costs are $733 an ounce on a gold equivalent basis. And uh, our life of mine, all in su sustaining costs, are 926 on a gold equivalent basis. Uh, slide 14 just looks at the uh, resource estimate. This has not been updated since uh, uh, 2018, actually. We, and this was the resource estimate that was used uh, when uh, we did the feasibility study in 2018. Uh, it's important to note that 94% uh, of our resources are in the measured and indicated category. We only have about a million tons uh, of inferred material. Most of that is in the underground. And uh, the M&I grade is uh, on a gold equivalent basis is 4.3 grams per ton. So uh, we believe it's a, a very high grade deposit. And you can see on slide 15, again, when we compare it to our peer groups, and, and we certainly think grade is king uh, for these types of projects, uh, you can see that uh, we're in the top of the range when it comes to when it comes to grade. So we do believe uh, again the ore body is open at depth. Uh, you can see there's two limbs here uh, on this slide. This is sort of a, a 3D model of the current ore body. Uh, we have drilled more than 130,000 meters uh, to date, and uh, there is, uh, you know, we're open uh, at the bottom of the pit. You can see uh, that limb number one and limb number two. Uh, you know, we do have uh, drill intercepts down there. One is at uh, 400 meters. Uh, the second limb is at 700 meters. But we have intercepts down at those depths where we're getting you know, grades of better than six grams per ton of gold. Um, you know, we've had a couple of intercepts, uh, well above 10 grams per ton. Uh, this will require additional drilling, and uh, but we certainly think there's an opportunity here at depth uh, to continue to add uh, tonnage to the ore body going forward. These two limbs, number one and number two, actually move uh, south of the pit. So we do have a, a river that runs up the western side of the pit. And uh, these two limbs extend uh, down south of the pit and, and sort of parallel uh, to the river. So just, just a quick uh, permitting update. Uh, so the four permits uh, I spoke about that, were, um, that we applied for in late uh, 2015 uh, were our Part 632 mine permit. Uh, that was issued um, in December of 2016. And uh, there was a contested case in, in Michigan. Uh, anyone can challenge a, a permit that's been issued by the state. You have 60 days to challenge that permit. Permit was challenged, a contested case hearing uh, took place and uh, the permit was upheld in May of 2019. Uh, air permit uh, was issued in December of 2016. We then amended our air permit and uh, that uh, amendment was issued in December of 2019. Uh, our NPDES, or National Pollutant Discharge and Elimination Systems Permit, this is a surface water discharge permit, uh, was issued in April 2017. And our wetlands permit was the last permit to be issued. It was issued in June of 2018. And uh, we do have uh, very uh, small uh, wetland impacts, about 11 acres of direct wetland impacts. 
And uh, we did have a contested case hearing on that permit, and we are expecting a decision uh, at any moment. Uh, coming out of the permit amendments, we did uh, apply for some permit amendments uh, after we published our feasibility study at the end of 2018. Uh, our mine permit amendment and air permit amendment were issued. Uh, what came out of those amendments is the requirement for a dam safety permit, and uh, that permit application is pending. Uh, you know, like a lot of companies in sort of these uh, these last several months. Uh, during the pandemic, we, we sort of uh, dropped tools and, and uh, we went on uh, a, sort of a, a, a shutdown uh, period. Uh, we have just started to uh, reopen and re-engage. And uh, so we do expect that that permit application uh, will go in uh, before the end of this year. So again, I just want to talk quickly about the relative valuation. I spoke about this uh, at the outset. Uh, but when you look at uh, um, the, uh, the company on an enterprise value to m and resource, again, we're looking at this on a gold equivalent basis. Uh, we're trading at about $15 uh, per ounce, uh, whereas our pure median is closer to 60. Uh, so we think there's uh, significant room for improvement there. Also on a price to that asset value, you can see that we're on the left side of the chart again at 0.3 times. Uh, where our peer median is is more like 0.5 times. So again, uh, we think opportunity to improve going forward. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our other assets and the district uh, scale potential um, on the belt. And again, uh, this is our asset, Bend and Reef. Both are located in Wisconsin. Both, we think, have uh, significant exploration potential. Uh, just to give you some scale here, so this... Uh, uh, this belt is very similar in size uh, to the Flin Flon belt uh, up in Canada. Um, Bend is about 130 miles from back 40. Reef is 80 miles uh, from back 40. Uh, so we're all in, in, in close proximity there. Again, we think there are additional opportunities uh, on the belt. There are 24 known mineral occurrences, and, and we continue to look for opportunities uh, where we can. Uh, Bend is a VMS deposit. It's, it has underground potential. Uh, so far, historically, there's been about 14,000 meters that have been drilled to date. Uh, the resource is non-43101 compliant. Most of this drilling took place uh, before those regulations went into effect. Uh, but you can see from that historic drilling, uh, grades were good, 2.4% copper, 4.7 grams per ton of gold. This is on federal land. And uh, we did strengthen our land position back in 2019. We actually acquired an adjacent uh, property for the mineral rights, uh, to the, uh, which contained the remaining portion of the deposit. And what we'd like to do going forward is we'd like to obtain a prospecting permit on the whole package area. Uh, that is in process as we speak. Uh, we do plan and are planning a drill program uh, as we speak. We'd like to update the resource, make it uh, 43101 compliant, and then uh, do some further evaluation, including technical and environmental studies. So those are the milestones for Bend as we move forward. Uh, Aquila did do some drilling at Bend back in 2012. Uh, this was before my time, but uh, Aquila completed 11 drill holes totaling 6,300 meters. Uh, drill results were good. Um, favorable results. And so we look forward to get, getting back on the property and uh, conducting uh, more drill programs. Uh, Reef is a high-grade uh, gold deposit. It, it, it is open pitable. It's a quartz vein style uh, ore body. Uh, we did, Aquila completed uh, a drill program again back in 2012, drilled 42 holes, totaling 4,400 meters. So very uh, shallow holes, and uh, the resource extends from surface to about 450 feet. Uh, currently, there's been no real deep uh, holes drilled at Reef. Uh, different than Ben, this is private land, um, and uh, it is 100% owned by Aquila. Most of the historic drilling that was done at Reef and the, the historic exploration was done at Inco, or by Inco and Miranda. Again, this was before uh, 43101. Uh, regulations. So it is non 
uh, compliant, uh, but again, shows promise, you know, close to half a million tons and uh, significant grades were grading close to uh, 11 grams per ton of gold. So upcoming milestones for Reef are, we do wanna uh, put together a drill program uh, for Reef. Uh, once we conduct those drill programs, like to update uh, the resource estimate, again, make it compliant with 43101 standards, and then evaluate uh, the future prospects uh, for the project going forward. Um, this next slide just shows, you know, sort of a, it's a, a a profile perspective of the uh, the ore body. Um, interestingly, we included a, a photograph here, which is a boulder that was uh, part of the sampling that was done on reef at reef early on. And you can see there's visible gold in the in the boulder. Actually, this uh, this small rock returned an assay of 379 grams per ton of gold. So very uh, high grade material. Uh, so, I, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our relationship with Cisco. Um, we did complete an investment with Cisco back in 2017. It included a, an equity private placement of $10 million and a gold stream with staged payments. Uh, we did receive $7.5 million of those payments uh, on closing of the facility back in November of 2017. A further $7.5 million uh, when we put out the feasibility study in October of uh, 2018. And the terms of the gold stream are uh, Cisco purchases 18.5% of the refined gold from back 40 uh, for a price of 30% of spot. Uh, that goes up to uh, a cap of $600. So once gold, uh, spot price of gold exceeds $2,000 an ounce, uh, they're capped at $600. Uh, once we deliver 105,000 ounces of gold under that stream, the stream percentage gets reduced uh, to nine and a quarter percent and runs in perpetuity. Uh, we did recently amend this and uh, we do have $10 million now of tranches that are due uh, in the course of the next uh, 12 to 18 months. They're based on specific project milestones, but on closing those amendments in June of 2020, uh, we did receive an additional two and a half million dollars. And then there'll be a final $25 million payment that will be due uh, on drawdown of a project debt facility. So uh, some of that uh, stream money will go towards the construction of back forward. Um, just a, a quick look at the management team. Uh, again, you know, we've been on sort of a, a, a bit of a pause over the past uh, three or four months while we were in this uh, COVID environment. Uh, we did uh, elevate Dave Anderson recently to general manager. So he is uh, the GM uh, down at site uh, in the US in Michigan. And uh, recently we started to add back uh, to our team. We, we brought back anyone that had been furloughed uh, during the, the COVID with the exception, I think of one individual and we've made two recent hires, uh, one being Bob a Mann, who's very recent. In fact, I think uh, his starting uh, date is today. And uh, he's, a, he's taking on the position of Director of Exploration. Uh, he's got 30 years of experience, uh, a lot of that experience being in Michigan and Wisconsin on the Pinocchio Belt. And most recently, he was the Senior Manager of Exploration at Lundin Mining. Um, that, that's the Eagle Mine, uh, specifically. And we hired Mike Foley as Director of Environment and Infrastructure. Mike's a civil engineer. He's worked in the Upper Peninsula and Northern Wisconsin for the past uh, 32 years. He was, uh, you know, instrumental in, in helping uh, Highland Copper obtain uh, their mine permit on the, uh, on the Copperwood project. So, Look forward to working with those folks uh, going forward. And again, as we continue to move back 40 towards a shovel ready status, uh, we will look to add to the team uh, moving forward. Um, and then the board, uh, no uh, real changes here. Uh, again, we have a cross section of individuals that uh, have a, a collection of, of backgrounds from mining operations to development uh, to finance. And uh, again, as we move forward, as we evolve and we look to upgrade and expand the team, 
uh, we'll be looking not only at management and leadership at, uh, at uh, Aquila, but we'll also be looking at, uh, at the board. Uh, in terms of value creation milestones, so these are things that we're focused on uh, going forward. Uh, so number one, uh, which we have a check mark beside, is just putting out the PDA, again, giving that enterprise view of the project, showing uh, the potential for underground mine expansion. Uh, we then want to do some uh, additional drilling at the back 40, uh, some geotech uh, investigation, uh, some infill in the underground, so looking to convert some of those inferred tons that exist in the underground. And then we'll look to do uh, some step out drilling uh, at depth to uh, add tons uh, to the inferred resource. Uh, we'll then look to do a resource update. Uh, we'd like to do that in the early part of 2021. Uh, we'll then do a feasibility study update. And then again, this is sort of in parallel, but we continue to advance uh, with pre-construction activities. And at the same time, look at opportunities in Wisconsin for exploration right now uh, we've got a lot to focus on with Reef and Bend, and we'll continue to put those programs together and hopefully look to ac execute a program uh, at Reef and Bend in the near term. And then long term, uh, it's all about Back 40 project execution and getting Back 40 into construction. Um, just a quick look at the capital structure and, and uh, uh, as we uh, just conclude the presentation. Uh, you can see we've got about 338 million shares outstanding at a share price in the 17 cent range. We're trading at about $58 million, uh, and that's a Canadian uh, dollar market cap. We're traded in Canadian dollars. Um, and our cash position on March 31st uh, was a little better than 2 million. Again, we did secure some additional financing in June with Cisco, and uh, we continue to work with our financial partners to uh, look for additional means to, to raise capital uh, to fund all the initiatives that I've spoken about uh, here today. Um, major shareholders, Orion, Ruffer, and Hut Bay, again, collectively, they own uh, better than 50%. And uh, uh, I think uh, that brings us to the end. So if I can uh, hand it back to you, Bianca, and certainly uh, would be happy to take any questions. Great. Well, I'm back. Can you hear me, Barry? Yeah, I can hear you great. Great. Okay. Well, let's definitely jump into some questions here. So let's start with this one. Uh, this one comes from Paul Renkin. He asks, uh, do you have any budget for the other portfolio projects this year? Again, it, it's subject to, to finance. Uh, we are putting uh, the, and, and just in process, on putting those drill programs together as we speak. Uh, it's going to be subject to budget, but our intention is to do uh, drilling at uh, both Back 40 and at one of our Wisconsin assets in the next six months. Great. This one comes from Mark Erickson, and he wants to know, um, when do you think you will put out a 43101 resource estimate on your Wisconsin projects? Uh, it's a it's a it's a great question, um, and again, it's going to be subject on uh, the size of the drill programs that we do. I think that's a, a goal for us to get uh, a 43 101 compliant resource estimate out on those projects uh, as soon as possible. It is going to require some twinning, and it's going to require uh, some updating of the uh, the existing resources and twinning some of the existing drill holes. Um, but uh, that plan is in, in motion. We do have, as I say, we just added a resource on the director of exploration front, uh, Bob Mann, who's going to be looking at these programs. And uh, so we should be able to update, you know, sort of folks where we're at there in the next three to six months and, and sort of how long that will take. But right now, what's most important for us is to get out there and, and to start drilling. Makes sense. Um, this one comes from Gary Williams. He says, at PDAC, I was told uh, one permit was being contested by Wisconsin First Nation. Can you please provide an update on this? Thanks. Yeah, so we've had three permits uh, that have been contested. The mine permit, uh, which, as I mentioned, uh, was resolved. 
And uh, so that permit was upheld. So it went through the full contested uh, case hearing and uh, the uh, judge upheld the permit. Um, the uh, second permit to be challenged was our wetlands permit. That permit, uh, again, the contested case hearing has passed and we are now just awaiting the judge's ruling. And we expect that's gonna come uh, pretty much any day. Uh, we did submit for uh, some permit amendments uh, that were based again on the design in the uh, feasibility study in 2018. Uh, those permitted uh, amendments were granted in December of 2019 and uh, they have been challenged as well. So that contested case process is ongoing as we speak. You know, again, the, the major permits, um, you know, have been challenged and uh, we'll wait to see what happens with the wetlands permit. But uh, as we move forward, you know, these, these smaller permit amendments or, uh, you know, other ancillary permits, they'll become a lot more focused in terms of uh, subject matter uh, for challenging. But, um, but yeah, there, there is a uh, Native American group out of uh, Wisconsin uh, who's opposed our project and uh, uh, continue to oppose the project. We have had them to site on a couple of occasions uh, I have been to their tribal legislature to uh, present to them in the past. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. We, we continue to be open to dialogue and, you know, we'd love to talk to them and we'd love to work with them. Uh, but right now, um, these challenges are ongoing and we do think that um, they will be resolved. At least the wetlands uh, permit should be resolved here uh, literally in the coming days. Makes sense. This next one comes from Stefan Iwano. Hi, Stefan. Uh, he says, hi, Barry. Uh, will the underground mine plan significantly impact back 40s uh, footprint as permitted under the open pit plan? Or will you be able to utilize the open pit and mined out portions of the underground for underground waste and tailings uh, deposition once the project, I assume, goes live? Yeah, we don't see uh, big changes uh, uh, to the footprint. I, I mean, uh, I you know I will just caveat again that it's subject to permitting. So we have not uh, started the permitting process. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, you know, feasibility study. Uh, so still additional drilling, baseline environmental work. So there, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done on the underground. But a, a big part of the tailings that uh, come out of the underground uh, would become part of uh, a paste backfill. So there is a paste backfill plant or a paste plant uh, that will be uh, uh, built as part of the underground and uh, that will be put back into the underground workings. Um, but, uh, you know, again, as we move forward, as we continue to do further uh, work on it, we have uh, more information related to a feasibility study uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, to update everybody, and uh, you know ultimately it will then be subject to permitting. This next one comes from Hugo Del Rue. He asks, "Are you planning a rollback?" Uh, we're not. Uh, you know, not that we're not uh, we're we're not adverse to it. Uh, certainly, I think that um, you know we would look at a consolidation. Uh, in the context of a transaction. So if there was a major transformative transaction or a financing, uh, and we felt that, uh, you know, at that time it was a good opportunity to consolidate the shares, uh, you know, we would look at it at that time. But um, just doing it for the sake of doing it, um, we don't think makes sense right now. And uh, again, although there's 338 million shares outstanding, uh, it is uh, quite closely held, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, three holders own more than 50% uh, between insiders, other institutions, and other high net worth investors. We think about 75 to 80% of the shares are, are in pretty safe hands, uh, but we're not adverse to it. I mean, it's certainly something that we would continue to evaluate uh, as we go forward. And if there's an opportunity to do it and make sense in the future, uh, you know, we'll certainly look at doing it. This next one comes from Paul Rankin. Uh, he wants to know your cash position and burn rate during 2020. Well, again, uh, uh, 2019 or 2020, I should say, we did uh, 
We put out our Q1, uh, which was at the end of March, uh, had a cash position of two and a half million. We've since brought in an additional two and a half million. And uh, as we mentioned in that press release, we also had a you know a favorable uh, tax settlement, believe it or not, related to HST here in Canada. And so that brought in another uh, 600,000 change. So, you know, we did in June bring in an additional $3 million. Um, you know, we do certainly know that we need to come to market and we're going to have to raise capital uh, at some point in the future. But uh, we do have some runway here right now. We are running uh, pretty lean. We have a small team. Uh, most of uh, the work that's being done, permitting related, um, you know, legal, et cetera, uh, we are obviously using outsourced resources. So those are internal resources that we're using. Um, and uh, so, and, you know, I think as was the case with a lot of companies just over the past three or four months, uh, we did operate uh, very, very lean. We, we watched our expenses very closely. There was a lot of uncertainty around uh, the whole pandemic and uh, now that things are starting to you know move in a different direction we've seen the gold market turn around quite substantially uh, but uh, you know even more interestingly just zinc copper you know this whole re reflation trade has caused a lot of these commodities uh, to move higher so we certainly think it's a better uh, financing environment which will be a good opportunity for us going forward um, but um, uh, you know, the, the burn is, is quite lean and, uh, you know, I want to, I don't want to say too much because we're putting out our quarterly tomorrow. So Paul, if you want to call me and talk to me after the quarter, quarter goes out tomorrow, happy to talk about it in more detail. This one comes from Joe Finkler. He says, how many jobs do you think will be created throughout your process? Yeah, so during construction, it's a you know it's a bit of a surge. So it's it's 400 to to 500 jobs uh, will be required uh, while we're uh, constructing back 40. Uh, but during steady state operations, it's about 250 jobs. Great. This is another one from Joe Finkler, who's a local oh. investor. Um, he wants to know when do you think the project will be shovel ready? Well. Um, you know, shovel ready is subject to a couple of things. Number one is uh, finalizing the permitting activity, getting our site compliant with all existing permits and updating our feasibility studies. So this is all work that's uh, currently uh, in the pipeline and, and uh, you know, the feasibility study will be updated uh, in 2021. And right now we're targeting a, a start date. And, and again, we're, we're trying to sort of position it in a window uh, but we're looking at a shovel-ready uh, sort of date uh, sometime in 2022. This next one says, uh, you mentioned the deposit remains open at depth. How much deeper do you think the resource goes? Well, it's a tough, uh, tough question to answer. Um, we haven't done a, a lot of drilling at depth. Uh, most of the drilling has been concentrated in the open pit sort of uh, some of the shallow, uh, shallower underground workings. Um, so we, we haven't put a lot of deep holes in the ground. That's certainly something we'd like to do going forward. Um, you know, during my tenure, we, we just have not done a lot of exploration simply because uh, of the costs associated and certainly deeper holes. Um, you know, there's a, a lot more costs associated uh, with uh, deeper drill holes it's sometimes easier to drill those holes when you're in operation. Um, but uh, we are planning on conducting uh, additional exploration. We do think those areas that I pointed out on the map, uh, that you know, 3D schematic of the ore body, that limb one and limb two, those are focuses of ours going forward. And we will look to drill uh, those areas in the, in the immediate term. The one is 400 meters. Uh, underground, the one uh, area is 700 meters. Uh, the ore body is dipping at an angle, and uh, you know the question of how deep is is you know pretty much anybody's guess. But we do think it continues, and uh, you know we'd certainly like to know how deep it goes. This next one is about the underground mining permitting process. Um, he says, uh, how does the underground mining permitting process work in Michigan? 
Yeah, it's very similar to uh, you know what we went through on the mine permit uh, for the open pit. Uh, again, uh, more study is required, more works required, and uh, you know I think it's important to note that uh, the underground mining really starts at the end of the open pit uh, life. So you know we really are talking about a 2030 and beyond proposition. So we certainly have a lot of time uh, to work on the underground. And uh, but, you know, there are a number of uh, baseline environmental studies that we'll have to do. Uh, there's uh, engineering that we'll have to do. And uh, then we'll have to put together a permit application uh, that would be submitted uh, to the uh, regulatory authorities in Michigan for approval. Uh, that's subject to uh, a public comment period and a public hearing, just like the mine permit was. And uh, we hope, you know, shortly thereafter, we would obtain uh, that that permit and that ability to mine underground. Having said that, you know that that process isn't going to start for a few years now. Will you be able to mine in Wisconsin if the deposit continues under the river? Um, right now, there's no plans on drilling uh, under the river or uh, near the river. We, you know, as I mentioned, those two limbs that are extending out of the bottom of the pit that uh, form uh, a big portion of the underground, they are dipping south. So the river kind of moves, the, the river is to the west of the project and, and kind of moves a little bit more west as you go south. Uh, so there's a little bit of separation uh, as you start to move south between the ore body uh, and the river. So right now there's no intention to drill um, uh, under the river. The PA noted that Back 40 is a well-defined project that also holds tremendous exploration potential. Uh, do you view the open pit phase of the deposit to be well-defined and the underground offers the exploration potential? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the open pit is very well-defined. It's, it's been very well drilled. It's 98% measured and indicated. So again, I, I think there's only 200,000 tons of inferred material in the underground, most of the inferred. Uh, oh, sorry, there's only 200,000 tons of inferred material in the open pit. Most of the inferred uh, is in the underground. So it's it's very well defined. Uh, the pit is also constrained by the river, right? And, and so the pit can only be so big. And uh, again, because of the way the ore body is dipping and it's going to depth, um, you know, the, the rest of the ore body, uh, you know, would be mined via underground method. Is there an opportunity to discover satellite deposits near Back 40 that would benefit from the existing infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, this is a very uh, mineral rich area. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, BMS deposits do occur in clusters. So, um, you know, there are a number of targets. We, we have identified uh, some of those targets. And, you know, I think in the future, there is an opportunity uh, to drill some of those targets again, you know, we want to be a little bit more selective in terms of where we spend that money. And the focus for us right now is, is at back 40 because the deposits are open at depth. Um, we'd like to uh, continue to focus on that. We did discover uh, a new lens in 2016 south of the pit. Uh, it was actually referred in that 3D model as our uh, 2016 zone, not, not very original name. <laughs> but um, uh, it does look very similar to the existing uh, deposit. It's about a half a kilometer away. And that is something that we'd like to uh, further investigate, you know, as sort of a satellite lens or a satellite deposit uh, as we move forward. But it is a rich area. There are a lot of targets. And uh, I think that, you know, just again, contributes to the long term uh, growth potential of the project. In the PA uh, press release, you mentioned that the price of Back 40 has an MPV in Canadian dollars of 420 million. Um, by that math, that's over a dollar a share in value. Yeah. What do you think investors are missing and what do you think it would take for the stock price to go up? Uh, well, I, you know, what are investors missing? I, certainly, we think uh, we're undervalued and I'm probably not the first CEO to be on this uh, webcast to say their stock's undervalued, but uh, uh, you know we certainly think it's undervalued, and, and we certainly think 
for those individuals that do think that uh, we are going to continue to see uh, commodities move higher, specifically gold, uh, it's going to be very, very beneficial uh, to projects like Back 40. You know, just, just in terms of the existing resource, not even talking about uh, any of the exploration upside that we've uh, that we've spoken about, um, but um, uh, but yeah, I mean, listen, we think we're undervalued, and uh, we think that in the past, uh, a lot of people have looked at, at us as a base metal project, uh, and although uh, you know base metals have had uh, again a comeback over the past two or three months, you know copper has come back from close to two dollars a pound, it's back. Uh, you know, pushing up against $3 again. Zinc, you know, hit a low, I think, of 82 cents. It's back up to $1.09 today. So, you know, those quantities have certainly come back. And zinc's a big part of the economic component of our project. But I think what people need to recognize is how sensitive our project is to gold prices. And, uh, you know, gold has got a lot of the attention um, of, um, you know, investors, certainly in the last uh, three months. And I, and I just think we're one of those sleeper uh, gold projects. Um, there is a lot of gold here. There's over a million ounces of gold uh, in the, the current resource, just at back 40. Um, and, uh, you know, again, if you're bullish on gold, it will be very beneficial for back 40 going forward. Great. And with that, I think that's the, the end of the Q&A period. I have one last question for okay. you. What are you most excited about in the next 12 to 16 months? I, you know, I think we're most excited about drilling, right? I, I think that um, you know we're we're in a market environment that I think is is interested in exploration again, and uh, so we're excited to go out there. We're excited to drill. Um, you know, we're certainly excited about the the upside opportunities at Back Forty, but we're also excited about Bend and Reef. You know, these are two projects that show a lot of promise, and uh, you know they're close by. They're on the same belt. Um, so we're very excited about the opportunity to, to drill and, and to uh, move forward on the exploration front. Awesome. Well, a big thank you to everyone who have attended and, and everyone who submitted questions. If you have a question that you weren't able to get answered today, or if you just thought of a good question for uh, Barry, uh, feel free to reach out to them directly. Their contact information is on the slide in front of you. Uh, and now I will pass it back to you, Barry, for the final word. Okay, I just uh, I want to say thanks everyone uh, for attending. Uh, appreciate your time here today. We look forward to updating you on our progress going forward, and I hope everybody uh, stays safe. Take care.